Good morning. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for participating. This Zoom is part of City Hall's ongoing outreach and communication effort with the business community. Uh, my name is Eric Dysart. I'm in the City Manager's Office here at City Hall, and I manage economic development. Uh, we've hosted various webinars with uh, different retail uh, business sectors, retailers, restaurants, schools, manufacturing, and so today we wanted to focus on those that are a bit more focused on the uh, tourism industry, so between the hotels and different uh, venues that we have in town. So um, ultimately our hope today is to communicate with you what some of the more recent uh, COVID-related health restrictions and protocols are um, to provide uh, you with a resource here at City Hall um, to pose any questions that you might have as we know this is a difficult time and there are various things that are, are changing. So ultimately uh, providing you with uh, one other resource to um, uh, help you with. So um, I want to kind of say in advance that this is um, kind of in part one is where I'll be introducing uh, Rachel Jambeck with our health department to share various uh, specifics. Um, but ultimately want to hear from you. You can use the uh, raising your, your hand feature in Zoom and uh, pose a direct question, or you can use the comment uh, function to uh, pose questions or even ideas as we go forward with this webinar. And uh, we'll take people uh, and, and questions at the tail end of the presentation. We also have uh, some representatives from um, the Visitors Bureau and the Convention Center with us today. Uh, Mike Ross, who is the CEO of the PCOC, um, and Christine Sousa and uh, Jeannie uh, with the uh, Convention Center as well. They'll be here as a resource as uh, maybe some of your questions uh, will uh, fold into some of their operational uh, 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 issues So uh, and, uh, and the marketing efforts that they're always uh, moving forward with. So I want to uh, go through a couple business items here too. So this is a uh, uh, webinar for those uh, in our invitation list essentially, uh, those in the sector of visitors and entertainment venues, and this is not for the media. So if you're a member of the media, please uh, disengage because all the comments that people are providing are off the record. You can, uh, if you're on the phone, please use pound, uh, uh, star nine, excuse me, to raise your hand. And uh, again, for those who are just on the phone, you could also use uh, star six to unmute yourself. So I hope that covers some of those uh, key items. And uh, with that, I'd like to just maybe re-emphasize that even though there are significant challenges with the business community closing for so long, uh, you know, this is still a serious health issue. There are over 64,000 cases of COVID in LA County alone, over 2,500 deaths, uh, which, uh, you know, each day we see more. So we can't dismiss the seriousness of that even though we're trying to get back to work and back to um, uh, kind of whatever the new normal is. So ultimately, just as keeping that in mind as a backdrop as we talk about um, our efforts to reopen. So with that, uh, Rachel Jambeck has uh, been taking the lead on many of these efforts at the health department, and she's here to share uh, a summary of what the kind of newest information is on the openings and the protocols associated with those. So, Rachel. Thank you, Eric. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Janbeck. I oversee the environmental health programs for the City of Pasadena Public Health Department. Um, as Eric had shared, we are moving slowly and cautiously through the stages of reopening, and the County of LA in whole has been significantly impacted by the coronavirus outbreak. And so we're taking, um, we're taking our time and we're watching carefully as businesses reopen to see the impact on the cases so that we can, um, we can make sure to do it in a responsible and cautious way. With that being said, many business types are reopening beginning today and a health officer order is being prepared as we speak. Um, the health officer order aligns with the LA County health officer order to open the same businesses. And it, it's happening in conjunction with the state's release of um, operating guidance for those particular business types. 
And so along with the health officer order, allowing the reopening of these business types will be guidance for each business type on what protocols need to be followed when reopening. All of that information will be posted on our website um, later today. And um, it will include guidance for the businesses that will be reopening. And I'm gonna go through the list right now because although many businesses are reopening, there are some restrictions to those reopenings. And um, for every business type that's reopening, it might not be a full reopening. And I'll explain. Um, outdoor museums were already allowed to be open, but beginning today, indoor museums will be able to reopen as well as gallery spaces. Um, day camps will be reopening. Um, with that being said, schools, K through 12 schools and also trade schools must remain closed at this time. Um, but schools are allowed to reopen only for the purpose of planning for next school year. But like I said, day camps will be reopening. So there will be daycare or childcare over the summer for those that are returning to work. Gyms and fitness studios will be reopening today. Hotels will be reopening for the purpose of tourism. With that being said, there might be some aspects of the hotel operation that will remain closed for now, such as hosting larger events or opening of a spa inside the hotel or massage services. Um, film is reopening. So um, uh, work related to filming can, can now resume, but film in front of a live audience is not necessarily reopening. There are some restrictions. Um, Sports are reopening without spectators. Some, um, some, I know I mentioned earlier that schools have to remain closed for the most part. There are some exceptions. Schools that train persons that work in our essential worker fields are reopening. And I'm gonna give you some examples. Uh, driving schools are reopening. Schools that train firefighters, medical personnel, police academy schools, um, and food safety schools, those will all be reopening now, but other schools must remain closed. Some things that are not reopening this weekend, but will be reopening in the near future, include our bars, breweries, and wineries. And that's effective across not just Pasadena, but all of LA County. For now, those will remain closed. And what I mean by that is bars, breweries, and wineries that cannot serve a meal with the alcohol purchase have to remain closed and I think they'll likely to be reopened in the next week or two. Um, massage establishments, um, spas, and uh, beauty services like eyebrows, waxing, facials, those are all still closed at this time, but we'll reopen when the governor moves us into stage three. Right now we're still in stage two, although a modified stage two, because we received a variance to move forward on a small number of business types. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the reopening protocols for the businesses. As I mentioned, the guidance uh, documents that we're creating, they are specific to each business type. So, excuse me, they're specific to each business type. And so if you're a hotel, you'll find a guidance document on our website by the end of the day. But, specifically to your operation. If you're an aquatic facility, you'll find a guidance document on our website by the end of the day that speaks to how to operate and reopen your pool. Um, the same for museums. So with that being said, there's a few things that every business needs to do. Um, you're going to find your guidance document and you're gonna fill it out. It's a protocol checklist and it includes all the things that need to be implemented before reopening of your business type. Once you complete it, you're gonna be um, asked to post it somewhere in your business where not only employees, but customers can see that you've done that. And they can refer to it to see what measures you're taking to keep them safe. A copy of the protocol must be distributed to every employee. And um, the items on the protocol need to be implemented in the business. Now there's no need to turn that protocol into the health department. It's a form of self-certification. And once you do it, you can open. You don't need our permission. 
but we will ask you for the document if we receive any complaints or concerns from the public or from staff regarding the operating practices. There are a lot of items on the protocol that are specific to your business type. And what I mean by that is if you're a museum, there are sections of the protocol that talk about how you can lead tours and who can be on the tour. And if you're a hotel, there are sections that talk about what items in a hotel guest room need to be sanitized between users and how to handle laundry. But right now I'm gonna go over some of the general requirements that apply to all business types. And then you can find the document and you can see the specifics for yours. Now all businesses are being advised to limit their staffing to only the minimum number of employees necessary. And what we mean by that is if you have office staff that can continue to do their work from home, for example, then what we're asking is that you continue to let them do their work from home. So we limit the number of people that are coming into their work. Um, we're also asking that employees are grouped into teams and that they continue to be scheduled together. And the reason for that is because if an employee becomes ill with COVID, any of the persons that they worked closely with on their shift might also be quarantined for 14 days. And by keeping teams of employees if a group um, ends up being quarantined, then you have your other team to continue your operations. Now, if you have employees that are sick, they must stay home for at least 10 days or for three days longer or after their fever ends, whichever is longer. And um, you are required to screen employees for illness every day at the beginning of their shift or you're required to ask the employees to self-screen before they come to work or at the time that they arrive. And we get a lot of questions about whether employers are supposed to take employee temperatures. The answer is it's not a requirement, but you can. Um, another option is for you to just ask the employee if they feel like they have a fever and they can self-report the answer or ask the employee to take their own temperature at home before they come to work. The guidance document includes a list of all of the symptoms that you should be asking that the employee um, self-report. Additionally, as the employer, you are required to provide hand sanitizer, not only for your guests, but also for your employees in any parts of the establishment where there isn't a place for them to easily wash their hands. You're also required to um, instruct your employees to wear face coverings and advise your customers that if face coverings are required when they enter the, your business or your property. Now, a face covering is a cloth face covering. It doesn't need to be an N95. Uh, and there are some um, individuals that do not need to wear a cloth face covering. So I wanna be clear about that. Um, children under two should never wear a face covering. Children um, between the ages of two and 10 should wear a face covering, but only if they are being supervised by an adult that's, that's keeping an eye on them. And then there are individuals with medical conditions that cannot wear a face covering because it would be hazardous to them. And so we, the persons that fit those categories have a right to enter your establishment or work in your establishment without a face covering. Now we're asking that um, when employees are put um, given break time, that they're encouraged to take a break away from the facility um, maybe even in an outside break area if there is one available so that they're not congregating in a small space in a break room. And we're asking that um, Here we go. We're asking that if any of your employees let you know that they've received a diagnosis for coronavirus or that they went and were tested and their test came back positive for coronavirus that you immediately call the health department and report that to us. The phone number and all the information on how to report is in the guidance document on the first page. And it's a very simple process. You reach out, one of our public health nurses gets connected to you right away. They'll talk to you about when the employee started to feel ill and they're going to ask you for information like what days did they work leading up to their illness and who did they work with? And if they interacted closely with clients, do you have that client's contact information? Perhaps you're a hotel and you know which hotel rooms that particular employee cleaned or which guests they um, served if they were in a dining area. They'll ask you to provide all that information so that they can determine who else needs to be isolated for a period of time. Some other things that we're asking businesses um, to do is if you're able to, think about our vulnerable populations. And what I mean by that is our, the older population or people who have underlying health conditions that are more susceptible to experiencing severe symptoms of coronavirus. 
and if possible, designate special times when they can use your facilities or take advantage of the services that you offer so that they can feel protected as well. We ask that when possible, you offer no contact payment options for your customers and that employees are trained on the safest way to exchange goods or, to, um, or for transactions to occur, such as setting the goods or a credit card or setting the cash down on a table and then stepping back and then having the employee or the customer step forward and take that item. And so there's, there's space between the two individuals. If there's a counter at your establishment where transactions occur and people have close to close interactions, we ask that you're putting a protective barrier up such as plexiglass in order to protect both the customer and the employee. We ask that where it's feasible, you think about propping doors open in your establishment so less indiv fewer individuals are touching door handles. And to use tape or decals to mark the ground in places where people line up for services so that everyone has the ability to maintain six feet of distance. We're asking that if you take customer appointments or you know that customers are coming in for a reservation at a particular time, that you stagger those times so that there aren't large gatherings or crowds of people coming in at the same time. Now, finally, um, we ask that everybody implement a disinfection plan. And the disinfection plan includes who's doing the disinfection, and it includes what surfaces they're disinfecting and at what frequency. And so all those items should be identified and then um, executed. Some of the high contact services that need to be disinfected frequently throughout the day include door knobs, light switches, bathroom fixtures, uh, trash cans, railings, banisters, phones, protective barriers, um, payment systems, touch screens, and then so many more depending on your individual business type. Part of your plan is to educate not only your employees but your customers on your plan. And because of that, the plan includes required, a requirement for signage to be posted in your, in your place of business. And um, the signage must include one sign that instructs people to physically distance, to keep six feet of space from other individuals. The other sign that's required is a sign that says that face coverings are required and that anybody who's experiencing symptoms related to coronavirus stay home. With that being said, um, I wanted to be clear on one other thing, which is that a lot of our businesses are opening, but one thing about the order has not changed. And that is that even though all of these business types are reopening, persons are only expected or um, should only gather with persons, other persons from their same household. So what that means is the expectation is if, if a group of people are dining at your establishment, it's a group of people that live together. And if a group of people are coming in for an appointment or they're staying together or they're enjoying a tour at your museum, that that group of people that's together, they're all from the same household and that activities that would mix multiple groups from different households are still prohibited at this time. So think about that and how it impacts your business related to maybe um, a tour or a reservation or use of a space and implement accordingly. That's my presentation, thank you. Great, thank you, Rachel. Appreciate your uh, thorough presentation. And with that, we'd like to remind people that our comment section is available for those who want to pose questions and or, or to raise your hand. And uh, with that being said, I think I'm going to turn to Michelle Garrett so she can kind of pose the first question um, that we can respond to. Hello, everyone. Uh, the first question that we received today um, is a question about private venues. If an event is in a private venue, um, when they're allowed to reopen for events, Will the requirement for physical distancing, will that be placed on the event venue or will that be a, a requirement placed on the host, the event host and the promoter? Rachel, would you happen to know an answer to that question? I can try my best. <laughs> um, the truth is that the guidance for that type of um, activity hasn't even been released from the state yet. And the process for the guidance development is that the state releases their guidance and then as a local jurisdiction, we have um, the ability to create guidance that's more strict than the state's guidance. 
or we can just match their guidance, but we can never be less strict. And so we wait for the state guidance to come out and we review it and we think about what, what's happening in, in LA in our area. And then we make a decision whether we're going to follow the state or we're going to implement something that's a little stricter because we need a little more protection here based on our high case numbers. Um, with that being said, physical distancing will absolutely be required when um, event venues are allowed to reopen, whether they're not in public or private spaces. Um, so far, the operator has been the one that's been um, responsible to implement. And with a lot of the businesses that I could say are comparable to the type being questioned right now, the, the, um, the user of the space will be required to designate somebody who's in charge of all of implementing all of the coronavirus um, protect measures. So I, I anticipate it will look something like that. Not the owner of the building, but the user of the space as the event organizer would have to designate somebody and ensure that they're being followed. Thank you. Uh, the next question relates to taking temperatures. Um, will event hosts, hotels, uh, different event venues, are they required to take temperatures of people coming into their spaces? The, the requirement is that employees and customers, patrons, guests, clients are screened for symptoms of coronavirus. But the screening isn't necessarily mean that you have to get a thermometer and take everyone's temperature. That part is optional. Screening can look like a lot of different things. Um, for some employers, I've seen employers implement an application where employees just log into their phone every day right before their shift and they check off a bunch of boxes that they are not experiencing those symptoms and then they're allowed to come in. For other employers, I've seen that when the employees arrive, there's a piece of paper and they have to check it off. For others, I've seen employers um, take temperatures as the employees are walking in and ask them questions about how they're feeling. Um, for guests, I know that's a little bit more touchy. Um, a lot of venues are just putting up signage that says if you are experiencing any of these symptoms and it will list every symptom, then you may not enter this venue or you may not enter our space. Please come back when you're feeling better. We appreciate your patronage, something like that. And then also including that information on your website and including that information on your social media pages. And we consider that um, meeting our requirement for screening people who are entering your facility. Thank I hope you, that Rachel. answered that your question. Yes. I think it did. Uh, so just a reminder that during today's webinar, you can ask questions one of three ways, either through the Q&A chat if you're at a computer, or you can raise a virtual hand at the computer and ask a question, um, or you can also press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Our next question coming in is in regards to large events that are still closed. What about smaller meetings? Are those allowed? And if so, how many people are they allowed to have in one, one space? So the Safer at Home order is still in effect. And the Safer at Home order says that no persons may gather with other persons outside of their household. So um, there are some allowances for meetings inside of a workspace, for example, if you have to have a meeting among employees in order to get work done, we're strongly encouraging those meetings happen virtually like our meeting today, but there is an allowance to have a meeting in a room where other employees sit six feet away from each other. Um, but as far as persons that are coming in order to enjoy like a show or an activity or celebrate something, if they are not from the same household at this time, it's still not allowed at, at any number. Got it. Thank you, uh, Rachel, for answering that question. We have a, a caller who would like to ask a question. Their phone number ends in 9108. Press star six to unmute yourself and go forward with your question, please. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm calling from the high place in Pasadena. I have uh, two questions, but just the question that you answered about the small events. What about business meetings? We have meeting spaces at our hotels, and uh, what if they, we have clients interested in utilizing our meeting spaces. That's kind of where the question was leaning towards, not for um, social gathering. 
So that's more of a form of a, a business meeting rather than a kind of open to the public type of event. So Rachel, if it's again uh, the ground floor of any hotel, often has those conference spaces. If guests are uh, needing to uh, congregate there, is that the six foot rule with uh, protections? You know, that, that's a very specific question and I can't say that I know the answer and I don't wanna guess what it is. So what I'd like to do is just get your contact information so I can respond after this meeting because I'm gonna have to ask the health officer for how that fits into all the requirements. Okay, I can definitely send you that. Uh, my second question is, uh, you mentioned that um, hotel guests who claim to have conditions uh, or I guess hotel guests who have, um, can claim that they have any conditions and they say about they can't wear the mask. So can we ask them documentation about any health conditions that prevents them from wearing masks? You know, there are some laws that, that protect people so they don't have to disclose medical conditions. And so we need to be careful to follow them. Um, my suggestion would be a very similar approach to how you would approach somebody with a dog that appears to be a service dog. Um, you can say, um, hello, valued guest, or, you know, however you would approach them. We require face coverings in our establishment. You, by, by you wearing your face covering, you're protecting everyone else, and by them wearing the, their face covering, they're protecting you. But there are some exemptions to that requirement and if you have a medical condition that prevents you from wearing a face covering, then you don't need to wear one. And then I would just leave it as that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask them to provide any documentation. I would just let them know what the requirement is. And then if they continue to not wear it, I would take that as that they have a medical condition. Great, thank you for that question, Sam. Our next question uh, is asking if there are protocols for interactive exhibits. Rachel, would you happen to know? It all depends on whether you're touching it or not, I suppose, right, Rachel? You know, I, I think that um, there's so many different, uh, there's so many different interactive exhibits and types and what that could look like, but I think that we just need to make sure to follow all the protocols and if we can't, the exhibit might need to be postponed until later. So um, if persons are touching something, it would need to be sanitized between persons. That might be a lot of work. So think about something like that. And then if the interactive exhibit requires that persons from household, from, from households that are not the same household, come within six feet of each other to interact, then that wouldn't be allowed at this time. But we have to go through the guidance and apply all the requirements and see if you can still do it safely. Thank you, Rachel, that's very good advice. Our next question is coming from Drew, uh, and he's asking whether uh, the city of Pasadena will be reviewing proposals so that his organization can resume concert operations. Okay. Um, so the, what will happen is the state will move the entire state to a stage where activities like that will be allowed. And so it's not something that we'll be able to do independently here in Pasadena or even in LA. The state would have to allow that to happen. So announce something statewide or announce that counties that have achieved a variance can move into that stage where large venues or even small concert venues can open. Once that happens, then um, you could submit a plan to the health department that includes your social distancing plan and your disinfection plan for your particular event. But we would not review it before it was allowed to happen because before it's allowed to happen, the protocols are not um, out yet. And so we wouldn't have something to compare it to to know if it meets those protocols yet. Great, so Drew's also asking about the relationship between the city of Pasadena, our health department and LA County. Um, do we defer to the county? Do we operate in lockstep? Could you elaborate on that relationship, Rachel? Yeah, absolutely. So the city of Pasadena is only one of three cities in the state that has its own health department. The rest of the health departments are county departments and there's um, 61 total uh, county, health depart county and state health departments statewide. 
in a lot of ways, the city of Pasadena Health Department operates completely independently. We um, have our own inspectors, we inspect our own facilities, and the facilities in no way report to the LA County Health Department. But with, regarding, with regard to the reopening, the state has decided that all this, although the cities do have their own health departments, that the cities that are within a county cannot move independently from that county that they're a part of. And so although we are operating separately from LA County, we have to move through every stage of reopening hand in hand with LA County, where we don't have a choice to move ahead or, or faster or slower at this time. Um, but with regard to who, whose protocols do you look at and who do you call if you have questions? If you are within the city of Pasadena, you're looking at the Pasadena protocols, you're posting the Pasadena protocols and that you're calling the Pasadena Health Department if you have questions. Great, Great. thank you, Rachel. Um, this next question, I'm actually gonna uh, ask someone from the PCOC to perhaps chime in. Uh, the Bridal Expo that is scheduled, it was rescheduled to September 27th this year at the Convention Center. Is that likely to happen? Uh, Mike, Christine, or Jeannie, could you give an update on what's happening at the Convention Center? Sure, this is Jeannie. So um, our clients, as um, they've been awaiting the guidelines for reopening, have pushed their events, um, uh, canceled their events, postponed their events as such. The bridal show in particular in September is awaiting any guidance that we receive through the state and the county that those events can take place. Um, as it gets closer to the date, most uh, meetings, conventions and of that type need about 10 weeks to sort of prepare, understand how they can operate and market to their audience. So um, at this time they're on the books, but I would anticipate unless we receive some guidance sooner that those events can take place, um, it will probably postpone to a later date. But um, we work with all of our clients. We're in constant communication with them to um, move their dates as we know more information. Um, but some people want to still hold on to the dates that they've reserved in the anticipation that those events can take place. Um, but we're not authorizing that they can take place at that time. We're awaiting any guidance that we receive from um, the city and the state. Great. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, so as a reminder, you can ask questions one of three ways, either through the Q&A chat if you're at a computer. You can also raise a virtual hand at the computer or press star nine on your phone if you're dialing in. We have a couple questions coming in about pools, uh, hotel pools. Are, they, are hotels safe to open their pools? And could you give a brief overview about what, is, what it's going to look like with the expectation for individuals in the water versus uh, perhaps individuals in a pool deck area? Rachel, could you take that one? Yes, I can. Um, pools are opening. Pools are opening this weekend. That includes hotel pools, pools in gyms, pools at aquatic facilities, rec centers, some of them. Um, and then uh, our hotel and apartment pools were never closed, but we are providing extra support with an additional guidance for them as well. I think the most significant um, protocol for pools is that it's a mandatory reduction to 50% capacity and the facility assigning somebody to monitor the number of pool users to make sure that that's not exceeded. And that's on the deck and that's also in the water. Um, with that being said, we're asking that if you have pool furniture that you spread that out so that people who are not from the same household have at least six feet of distance from other people who are lounging or dining by the pool. Um, that if you are not swimming, that, you, that the users wear face masks, especially while they're moving around the pool area or when they get up to order food or if they go to the restroom, for example, they need to put their face mask on, but then they should not wear it in the water for obvious reasons. It, when they become wet, they can't be breathe through very well. Um, we're asking for a disinfection plan for the pool area. So that's um, disinfecting all furniture and pool toys and equipment between each user. And so the facility will have to set up a system where they know when, for example, a chair or a table's been used by a user or, or a flotation device 
and those are deposited in an area where they are, um, everyone knows those need to be disinfected. And then there's another area where those items um, are disinfected and ready to go back out to the guests again. So it's, it's establishing that, that, that system. Um, and then extra disinfection in the um, restroom or locker room area, if that applies to you. And um, it's also sanitizing things like the gate latch, if there's a gate at your pool, or the doorknobs and door handles leading to the pool and the railings around the pool. Um, and then people should only swim with persons that, they, that are from their own household. And Rachel, the assumption right now, as far as restaurants and hotels, that if people are coming together, uh, either to eat together or to uh, stay at the same hotel, that they're from the same household, or is there an obligation from the restaurant or the hotel to uh, specify that? Um, we are, so for our restaurants, the, the, you, everyone knows they reopened kind of two weeks ago, but it's been a really slow reopening with all the demonstrations and the curfews in LA. Um, the protocols are very specific. It's six people or less dining together and they all must be from the same household. And a lot of our restaurants are asking us, what is the expectation as far as enforcement? And we recognize there's no way for a restaurant to enforce that because if people from a different household wanna to dine together, they're just going to say that they're from the same household and they're going to dine together. The expectation is not that the facility enforce it, the expectation is that the facility communicate it. And so what we're asking restaurants to do is at the time of the reservation or with signage on their website, social media outlets or signage at the facility, it's clear that that is the intention of the reopening, that, that it's for persons from the same household. Great, thank you. Great, we have a dial in participant who'd like to ask a question. The phone number ends in 8853. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Go ahead and ask your question. All right, we're gonna move uh, to another question that's come in. This is from someone who operates outdoor tours that are docent led. Um, they would like to know if it's appropriate to conduct outside, out, I'm sorry, outside tours at this time, and if they limit how many people are involved, that they're masked, and that they're distanced uh, from those that are not part of the tour group. Is that allowed, or does that need to happen in a later stage? And they had a similar question, uh, or an add-on question, with regards to whether or not they need to enforce whether tour group uh, participants are from the same household or not. Rachel, could you take that one? Yeah, so before today, activities like group tours were not allowed at all. And with the reopening, the gradual reopening of what we're calling our museums and our cultural institutions, tours are being allowed at a very limited rate or a very like restricted um, rate. And, and let me reiterate again, and this applies to museums, and I think it applies to the question that's being asked right now. If you're leading a tour, then the members of the, the persons participating in the tour must be from the same household. So it's a baby step for this type of activity. It's, it went from not allowed to allowed only with people from the same household. And the expectation is that that's communicated to the participants, either at the time that they book or um, on your website, on your social media pages, you know, whatever, whatever mechanisms you use to communicate. There is, you will not be punished or cited for, um, for someone's noncompliance, but you are responsible to communicate the requirement. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, let's try our dial-in uh, participant again. Their phone number ends in 8853. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Are you there? Go ahead, ask your question. Oh, I think they keep muting themselves. Press star six. One more time. If there you go, ask your question. Hello? Yes, hello. Is uh, pet grooming open now or not? Great question. Uh, Pet grooming is open for curbside operation, and it's been a couple weeks now. 
And so you can drop your doggy off. Um, you pull up to the business and you call them when you arrive and you stay in your car and then they send somebody out and the exchange happens on the sidewalk. And your dog can uh, be brought to the hotel now too, right? <laughs> There's yeah, no right. restrictions on doggies. They come from the same household, so they're okay. Right. Okay, great. Great, so our next question is about um, some of the cash handling recommendations. If, they, if someone operates 100% cashless, is that allowed? If they choose as an, a business operator to do that? I, I, can, I can say that we're not, we're not requiring that. Um, we're recommending contactless payment options so that people can choose that option if that's their preference and they feel safer making a payment that way. But I, I know I recognize as, as someone who works in public health the inequity of not taking cash um, in a transaction, I, but I can't respond to the legality of it. Eric, do you know? Yeah, I think governments are still supposed to provide that option, but I would be guessing that the private sector can decide on their own, but uh, that's a little bit out of my uh, wheelhouse. So I'd encourage you to check that out through a different source. Great, uh, our next question is in regards to the uptick and potential uptick in uh, COVID-19 cases. Is there a possibility that the city will uh, revert back to phase one and shut down again? You know, we're watching the cases and the intention of this incredibly slow and cautious reopening is, is to hopefully prevent that from happening. It, it's our goal to just slowly move forward. But with that being said, it is a possibility, depending on how quickly cases rise and how quickly the number of hospital beds and ventilators become um, used. At, and then if, if, if it's necessary, it, it is possible. Great. Uh, the next question, on, I'm not sure if this is referencing a gym within a hotel, um, but I guess one, are those allowed now? And if they have plexiglass barriers between their gym equipment, um, does the equipment need to be spaced for social distancing even with a barrier? Uh, gyms are allowed to open whether they're within another facility or in, um, standalone. And also fitness studios, for example, a bar and yoga, Pilates, they're now allowed to open. Um, that the requirement is that if people are using a studio, for example, that there are fewer people in the room exercising at one time so that they can all maintain that distance. And that if people are exercising on the equipment, that the equipment is spaced out. And if lines form at a particular piece of equipment, there's even um, markers on the ground for where people should stand to make sure that everybody has not six feet, at least six feet of space between each other. I think in most cases, using plexiglass barriers would probably not be effective, but um, if you have a particular situation and you feel like the plexiglass barrier can reach high enough and wide enough to block a, a large piece of equipment from a large piece of equipment next to it, then we can talk offline and we can look at your proposal. And there's another question here that just relates to whether or not with the increase in uh, COVID cases, if there's a possibility that we would transition back to a phase one, and certainly that is possible. Um, you know, there's been a broad uh, concern that uh, as other states have opened up quick, quickly, <laughs> or if there is in the fall, um, you know, another swell in cases that, uh, you know, it would exceed the capacity of our local hospitals. So if that is the case, then certainly there is the possibility that we'd go back to a, a phase one or a phase two. So that is um, a possibility. Uh, Rachel, if you want to elaborate on that, but that's uh, something that we can't predict at this time. It, it's really hard to predict, but, but what I was trying to communicate earlier is that we're moving slowly because we're hoping that that won't happen. And the slower we move and the more we're able to watch the cases rise slowly, then we can kind of make small adjustments instead of making such a large adjustment as going all the way back to stage one. Um, and, and so that's our goal. That's what we're working on. But I can't say that it's, a, it's not possible. It is possible. All right. So our next question um, deals with more of the code enforcement side of things. 
So while hotels and dining establishments are expected to communicate health protocols uh, and, and do their best to enforce where they can, if there are complaints, how will the health department or city react to that? Rachel or Eric? So um, again, the city is um, reacting to uh, complaints um, and that's where um, having the checklist is very important. Um, as Rachel mentioned, um, it's something that is not required to be submitted to the city in advance of a business or a, a other um, kind of museum or hotel opening. It's just that you've had to have gone through it, uh, have that on file, sharing it with your employees. And if there is a complaint, then um, the city will uh, come and, uh, and visit and make sure that you do have that checklist on file and to uh, ask uh, specifics about the, that relate to the complaint. So, Rachel, I don't know if you want to get into which department uh, responds. I know it's a combination of our code enforcement and our planning and building group and also with your office. Um, yeah, I, I can provide just a, a small amount of detail. So right now, if, if you have a restaurant, in the next week, you're going to see one of our health inspectors they're all trying to do personal visits and their purpose is that they're, they're going to answer your questions. They're knocking on every restaurant store to say hi and do you have any questions about the protocols and did you have any um, challenges with implementation and how is it going? Um, but for most of the business types, code enforcement is taking the lead, not only with the outreach, but with the enforcement. So if we do get a complaint, um, code enforcement goes and it's, it's an educational visit the first time. But if they receive multiple complaints about the same business and it's the same issue each time, eventually it does get escalated to the point where the city attorney's office or the police are involved. But I don't think that that's really happening. I think everybody's trying their best and um, the city's taking an educational approach initially. Great. Um, our next question uh, touches on some of the reopenings that you mentioned, Rachel, at the start of the call. And I think they're just looking for clarification on whether bars, breweries, and wineries can open um, if they are serving food, or is it a complete uh, closure still at this time, even under that condition? Sure. So oh, it is confusing because the state put out guidance for bars to reopen. But I want to be really clear. If you're a bar, a brewery, and a winery, and you don't serve food, you are not allowed to open this weekend. In Pasadena and throughout, throughout LA County, those types of establishments are still ordered to stay closed. With that being said, if you're a bar, a brewery, or a winery, you're encouraged to partner with another business that can serve meals at your facility if you'd like to open for sit-down dining and alcohol service. But the state has a very specific restriction, and that restriction is that a meal must be on the same transaction as the alcohol that you're selling. And so you would have to logistically work that out with a partner restaurant, for example, that's near you in order to provide that um, service on the same ticket. And um, please call me if you have questions about that and I can walk you through a little bit of what that process looks like. Because if you're a bar and you don't have a kitchen, from the health department's perspective, you're not allowed to bring food in and start processing or making or even holding food because you don't have a kitchen. And so the food really does need to come from the other location simultaneously while the alcohol is coming from you. And I can talk to you about some examples of where I've seen that work here in the city. And Rachel, so when it comes to either a museum or a hotel where they have public restrooms um, available out the lobby, um, what are some of the specific issues that uh, they have to be uh, concerned about? Keep them open. Um, the bathrooms are so important. We want our employees and we want our guests to wash their hands. And if those restrooms are closed, then people aren't able to wash their hands when they need to. We want people to wash their hands when they come into our establishment. We want people to wash their hands after they touch things. We want people to be able to wash their hands before they eat and when they're leaving. And so those public restrooms not only need to be open and accessible, but we need to identify employees that are checking them more frequently, making sure that the hand soap is stocked in the dispenser, that there's plenty of paper towels. And if you can prop the door open, prop the door open. Sometimes the configuration doesn't allow for that, uh, but in some restrooms it does. 
um, if you can, and you're not um, obstructing any kind of ADA, uh, creating an ADA violation, put a trash can close to that door so that if people have to open it, they can use a paper towel and they can grab that door handle and then they can throw the paper towel in as they're walking out. And then they don't have to really touch the handle with their hand. But those are the kind of things that we're recommending. But the key thing is don't close them. Sorry um, to go back. I, there was still a second part of that uh, restaurant question uh, for bars and breweries. Uh, where can people find specific guidelines for that? Is that going to the state website or should they email you, Rachel? So right now the guidance for restaurants to have on-site dining is at, it's out and it's on our website. But we haven't released guidance for bars to reopen that don't serve food because they're not allowed to be open yet. And at the time that they are allowed to open without food, then the guidance will be available. Okay, so you had mentioned partnering with a neighboring establishment and having a transaction reflect both the, the meal and, and the alcohol. Uh, how could they find out more about that? Well, they could refer to the restaurant guidance if that's something that they're interested in doing. And then they can email me directly and let me know what restaurant they're, they're considering working with and I can walk them through that process. Great. Um, uh, Mich Michelle, will you be providing everybody my email or should I just say it out loud? You could say it out loud. Uh, through the q and A, I I am providing uh, people who ask your email address. Okay, if you have a specific question about your food facility, please reach out to Environmental Health and we'll help you to make sure that you're in line with all of the requirements. It's a little confusing right now. My email is rjanbeck at cityofpasadena.net. That's r-j-a-n-b-e-k at cityofpasadena.net. So one of our participants is asking if the city offers generic signage for public areas such as pools and gyms. Uh, Rachel, earlier this week, we finalized some generic signage for our businesses that uh, demonstrate all the required protocols for the public and for employees. Would that same signage apply for pools and gyms? You know, Michelle, I think the signage just had um, the requirement to wear face coverings, to stay home if you have symptoms, and to physically distance. Is that correct? Yeah, there are maybe two or three other items on there. Um, from what I recollect, it would apply across the board to all of our businesses, and it's a beautiful sign. <laughs> Very good. So, uh, people who are listening in today, you can find that uh, signage on the city's COVID website for business. And if you go to cityofpasadena.net, in the center of the web, web page, you'll see a big green button for COVID-19. Click on that and navigate your way towards the business page, and that's where you'll find that sign. Um, the next question that we have is from someone asking about the, the group restrictions on when uh, people are visiting restaurants, hotels, or events, um, and the requirement that they be from the same household. Is that going to lift mm -hmm. during phase three, or is that closer to a phase four um, yeah. uh, lifting? Oh. Rachel? Hey. Um, that change, I, I don't know when it's going to happen. I, you know, they're watching the numbers. It's not a decision that's being made on my level. And um, I, I haven't heard, so I, I have no clues that I can share with everyone about when, when that will happen. So we are reaching uh, a few minutes before noon. We'll take another couple questions. Um, uh, Michelle, do we have a couple more? We certainly do. So. Um, we have a, somebody who's listening in and uh, wants to know about office spaces for his, uh, his production and theater company. Are office spaces allowed to reopen right now? Yes, office spaces were allowed to reopen a couple weeks ago. There's guidance posted on our website. Um, similar to the other business types, we are asking if there are persons that can do the work that, and do it effectively from home, that they continue to be allowed to work from home but we recognize that for some positions that's not possible. And then when they're brought into the office, there are the same protocols and you can read through the guidance. Sanitizer must be available. Their workstation or their desk needs to be physically distanced from others. So in some instances, offices will need to reconfigure their space before bringing their employees back. Great, thanks Rachel. Um, we have a question about food and beverage uh, operations at hotels. 
Uh, will they be required to, it says process permits to reopen, uh, and I'm not sure if that means, do they have to submit anything to the health department to reopen, or can they just reopen uh, as they were before COVID? Um, as far as the hotel food and beverage operations, none of your permits were canceled when you um, temporarily closed. But if you did temporarily close, please just complete the protocols, execute them, and then you can reopen on your own. You don't need permission from us. Your health permit is still valid. But with that being said, a lot of our smaller hotels are doing continental breakfast only. And typically continental breakfast is a self-serve breakfast. But the state guidance and the local guidance does not allow any self-serve right now. And so for those offering continental breakfast, you're going to have to transition all those food items to packaged food items for the time being. But you can also have a staff member plate that, correct? So that That's would correct. allow maybe the same format as long as the staff member is plating it for the customer. If that was the case, then um, set up some tables to keep customers away from the food items and then have a staff person serve, like hand them, the, they can point them out and then the staff person can hand it to them. Right. Thank All right, you. we have two related questions um, to high touch, frequently touched surfaces. Uh, within museums and other venues, uh, should drinking fountains be restricted? And then second, um, we have somebody asking about nanoseptic, and they're wondering if that would be recommended to uh, disinfect frequently touched areas. You know, I'm not familiar with the product, but if the label says that it's effective against common um, viruses and the flu virus and the common cold, then it would definitely be effective against coronavirus. Coronavirus is not actually a particularly hardy virus when it comes to surfaces. And so just read the label and follow the label instructions. The most important information on the label is the contact time. So sometimes you'll, you'll um, think that if you just wipe it a second later, it's disinfected. But in actuality, the moist product has to sit on the surface sometimes for 60 seconds before all of the virus is killed. To answer the other question about the drinking fountains, I think that you need to consider your own um, operation for each one uh, individually. So for a lot of our operations, we're asking so if you can hand out bottled water, if that's something you're able to do, go ahead and do that because that's the easiest and the safest option. If you have drinking fountains open, then we just ask that you include the buttons and the surfaces on the drinking fountain as part of your disinfection plan so that somebody's going by and disinfecting that frequently, I would say every hour. Great, thank you, Rachel. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for uh, participating in this webinar. Hopefully it's been of uh, use and uh, informative. Uh, a lot of this is changing. Uh, that's one reason why we wanna make sure that we're open about what is uh, um, available now as far as information and things that are evolving. Uh, please continue to reference the city's website, um, cityofpasadena.net, and then there's a large COVID button that goes to a range of resources. Uh, again, uh, Rachel provided her uh, email. She's been a great resource here in Pasadena. I want to thank her and her team for continuing to uh, watch out for our health. Um, and uh, I want to thank those who participated from the uh, Convention Center and Visitors Bureau. And uh, again, if you have any uh, questions, um, the city is very eager to help and uh, eager to see things uh, open and getting visitors into town and uh, being uh, uh, successful with our future endeavors. So again, thanks for your participation and uh, we'll see you again in the future. If things uh, change dramatically, we'll do another uh, webinar like this um, to share information that we have. Thanks again.